Well, good morning, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. We encountered a crazy snowstorm last night, and uh, phew, that kind of prompted, I'm probably gonna have to leave pretty soon because um, the weather just looks like it's gonna keep getting worse, and my grandpa doesn't particularly uh, feel comfortable driving all the way to Columbus, which is where I'm flying out of, um, and that's like an hour and a half away, so we're trying to see if I can't figure out a way to leave tomorrow or then you know somewhere around there where my sister can get me a ride out there but um, I think we're gonna go first thing go visit my mom today and then hang out with my sister and I'm gonna take Tara and Brandy out for dinner tonight for Christmas so we'll see what else happens uh, I have another friend that wants to meet up but it'll just depend on how bad the roads are so days with Jordan the lion and a freezing Ohio begins now Papa made me another one of my favorites mac and cheese Macaroni and cheese and corn. Not much protein in there, but that's okay. I also have all this chocolate from the Turcotte, so I'm gonna deliver some of it over to my parents' house because my stepdad is a chocolate fiend. He's like the dad on Christmas Story that with his, uh, his turkey. So I, I figured since I'm gonna be leaving really soon, I can't eat all of this, so I'll keep a little bit of it and I'm gonna give a lot of it to him. Well, we are definitely getting snow. All right, we just dropped off some goodies to my mom and now we're on to Tara's house. All right, we've made it to Dayton. There's Esther Price. Were you teaching Tucker how to beg, Jaw? You saw Brandy trying to make food and you, you were trying to either help her or con her into giving you something, weren't you? What are you doing, Tucker? Tara and I, I think we're gonna first hit the uh, the Funk Hall of Fame, even though they won't let me film, I'm gonna see if I can talk them into something. And we'll go from there. Well, poor Tara hasn't got to eat yet, so we decided to go to Casano's, which is kind of a, uh, well, it's a date and treat. Well, they have them everywhere, but I love Casano's. My mom doesn't, that's why I haven't had it yet, but since Tara does, guess what? We came to the Pizza King. And here's the story of the Casano family. Vic Cassano. They actually have one in Troy, are they? I grew up uh, eating one. I don't think it's there anymore, but I love it. And everybody that's ever been to Ohio knows about this. Mike sells potato chips. Let's see if it's as good as it was last time I've been here. It's been a while. They have a, I like their sauce, I love it. I believe that is Vic Cassano. There's the Cassano's delivery truck. And even though I had some macaroni and cheese already, we got a smaller pizza, I'll have a few pieces. Great chair. Look at this, the Cassano's Dawsonettes. Well, our pizza just arrived and Tara decided she would like a salad. And she also told me today that her and Brandy have decided they're gonna get married in St. Thomas. Um, I keep calling Brandy my sister's girlfriend, but it's actually her fiance. I, I, it's just a habit for me. It's hard to break, but um, yeah, they decided they're gonna get married in St. Thomas, so I may have to look into uh, how I'm gonna get to St. Thomas. Well, I'd say Tara and I took care of that. Well, Vic, you done good. It was amazing, thank you. Well, there's Jilly's, the uh, local blues joint. Well, we made it to the Funk Museum. I don't know if they're gonna let me film in there. They've already said no, but I'm gonna try and talk them into it. This might be all you get to see, so we'll see. Heck, they don't even look open. Well, it says that they're supposed to be open because it's Saturday, but they're not. They're, we buzz. there's nobody, not a good way to run a museum if you want people to come if, you know, you're not open. But there it is. Well, since the Funk Museum wasn't open, we're gonna try and find something else to do. And, uh, well, we have concealed carry here in Ohio, so a lot of the businesses will have this on there. But I was driving by here and I started laughing because I was telling my sister, I go, Way back, like when I was heavy into Guided by Voices, they showed this on one of their documentaries and one of their, uh, their uh, things that they were laughing about was that this used to be a, like a porno store and for years it was right here beside Dayton Church Supply. Nobody was ever able to figure out why that was or who would wanna do that. But as we were driving away from the Funk Museum, I looked over and I go, 
Oh my gosh, Tara. They got, they got rid of the porn store right next to the uh, Dayton Church Supply. I should put that on there and tell the story. Just kind of one of those oddities that everybody I met that would come to Dayton and would be driving down here on 3rd Street would always go, did you know that there is a adult bookstore right next to the church supply? And I would say, yeah, we all know that. Look at that buffalo. Gee. So we actually decided to come to Carillon Park because my sister was telling me there's a brewery over here that actually brews beer the way they used to in the 1800s, like with weird barrels and the whole the whole thing. But she said, they actually, this section over here, part of Carillon Park is, used to be old homes in Dayton that they've actually picked up and moved over here to kind of preserve them. Well, here we are. We're gonna hit this second. We're gonna go to the brewery first. But this is the uh, the Carillon Museum, and apparently they actually have some original Wright Brothers stuff inside there. My grandpa was telling me about that the other day. All right, you can see a sign down there that says Cash for Barley, and we have made it. I'm excited to see this. I saw pictures of it online, and uh, even though I don't really drink, Tara does. She will. Oh, wow, look at that. That is awesome, look at that. All the pulleys and everything, that is cool. Look at that, that is awesome. You can see how they do it. You've got the fire and the guys over here and then there's the hops. Pretty cool. There you can see some of the barrels. Look at that, old school. Look at this, really historic building. Historic looking even. Right here, all the uh, the beers on tap, and if you look behind, you can see they have a big picture up there that says the view of Dayton. That was an old view of Dayton. <laughs> they said they're actually not brewing today. They took the day off of brewing, but that's all right. I just like seeing this kind of stuff, so. Look at the light fixtures. Booming city. Boom. Here's a cart. My sister was actually telling me there were a lot of, uh, like during Prohibition, they were actually, some of the bars that are around here now actually had underground kind of secret cellars. Here's the, uh, the history. Look at that. Peak for the brewing industry in Dayton was 1880s. Well, there you go. They recreate the 1850s in historical ingredients, methods, and recipes. So I am actually gonna have a drink with my sister. I feel like I've stepped back in time being in here. So you know, of course, normally I never would have a drink, but uh, since they brew it all here, I figured I should try something. I took the weak one and my sister took the, uh, the professional one. The beer is actually really good. And the reason that we actually came in here is because like my sister was saying, and they actually have it right here on their menu, it's the only living historical exhibit of its kind that still does this in North America. So it's basically like, a, it's a brewery, but it's a museum, it's a bar, it's a little bit of everything. And right on the menu, they actually say that the whole purpose here is that they, they serve the same style of beer. And my sister was actually saying, you'll find that a lot of them taste a little bit sour because that's the way beer was back then. But their menu actually mimics the 1850s. And they say that this is the same style of beer that you would have gotten that would have been transported here via the Erie Canal, which used to run right up here that brought all their foodstuffs and goods and everything to the area. All right, we're gonna get out of here and we're gonna go next door to the museum. And here they actually have an outline how you do the whole process, so even if they're not brewing like they weren't today, follow that and you can figure it out from there. So we're gonna do this and then we're gonna head out and I think we're gonna, Brandy's not feeling too good, so we're gonna pick up some food and uh, go back and get ready for, it's New Year's Eve. So when you guys are watching this, Happy New Year. Look at that, how welcoming. <laughs> All right, we're about to go in. We actually went in, paid and everything, and then I realized it's starting to get dark. I wanna get my other camera. And much like I mentioned in the vlog the other day, Dayton Triangles were the first NFL team. Look, they have live carolers. So here we go, we're entering the world of the National Cash Register Company. Look at all those old cash registers. 
Yeah, Tara's right. They, I mean, they really look like almost like works of art. Yeah. Now they're not actually in Dayton anymore. My grandpa was telling me they uh, they moved out a few years ago to Atlanta, and I said, why, why was that? And he gave me the obvious answer. He goes, well, who uses a cash register anymore? I said, yeah, good point. Well, much like my grandpa was telling me, a lot of the starter and different parts of the automobile, things that would actually make it go, the ignition system, everything was kind of invented or created by Charles Kettering. And uh, here they have an ancient Cadillac. Look at that carousel. First off, there's about a billion cash registers in here. There's a model train set. Let's get above that. Thank you, wide angle lens. Then you have the walls are just covered in old cash registers, which who could complain? And then look at that, the old Dayton carousel. And look up there. When you get admission to this place, you actually get to go outside and they have a ton of buildings out there that were historical to Dayton, one of which is called the, um, what did they tell me that was called? The Newcomb Barn. And the Newcomb Barn, they said, was actually the very first public building in Dayton. So it acted as a post office, a jail, pretty much anything. And everything in this museum is actually um, created or invented here in Dayton. So you can actually see the Harry Walton soapbox derby car up here. And then here is a Christmas display of all these old model trains. Look at that. And then you can actually, as Tara's doing, you can actually go up inside the train. You can see right there, American model builder. So check this out. We saw this little building and it says, watch your head. And I'm like, ah, I just walked right past it. And then Tara mentioned it and I look and it gets Juvenile Manufacturing Company. And it was Charles Deeds son, or it was actually the son of Edward Deeds, Charles, who got a bunch of his buddies in the neighborhood to get together and they started their own company at the age of eight. And you can see right here, they produced wood metal products, basically waste pa paper baskets, stools, Look at that, how about that? Look at these kids, unreal. Gotta love Dayton history. So these are actually two things that the little juvenile manufacturing company made. They made those wooden baskets for Tinker Toys and then ironically an ashtray. And we were actually starting on the back end of the manufacturing company but this is the front. There is the Liberty engine made by the Dayton Wright Airplane Company. Guess who invented the pricing gun? Dayton. And here are some printing plates from McCall's. Magazine manufacturing. Look at this old Dayton motorcycle. 1914. How about that? Look at this. And there's some old timers riding the motorcycles. And then you see the bikes hanging from the ceiling. That's because the Huffy Corporation's from here. And you're looking at that and you're going, what the heck is that? It's the top to a can of soda, or as we call in Ohio, pop. And the toilet. And look at this, more stuff about the uh, National Cash Register Company. That wicker seat was actually for an airplane, if you can believe that, for the DH-4. There's quite a bit of military history here. Take a look at this guy. A lot of World War I history, actually.
Oh, they even have it running. Nice. I wouldn't have expected that. Now it's a little hard to see, but if you look up on the uh, the wood bracings, they have a lot of the companies that were big in Dayton at the time. You can see the Miami Erie Canal Boat Company, Soapbox Derby, Esther Price, um, the National Cash Register, of course. Mike Sells. Mike Sells, yeah. Carillon Park Museum, great. Mike Sells. Just like we saw in Casano's. There's a box of Esther Price just rolled by. And there's the cash register. Very unique carousel, wouldn't you say? There's the Dayton motorcycle we just saw. Look at that. And there's the Esther Price again. All right, now we're gonna work our way through the outdoor part of the museum. And, uh, in complete contrast to the Funk Museum, who didn't want you to take photos, heck, they didn't even want to be open today. This place, actually, when they found out what I was doing, they not only offered me a business card to call someone who's um, kind of a high up here that can answer any questions I might have, but they also wanted my, uh, my vlog info so they could watch it. Now, this building right here, I believe this is the one that I told you about, the Newcomb Barn. This was the first public building in Dayton. And you know what's interesting about this is that they said, uh, they have a handful of buildings out here. They said every one of them is open and you can go ahead and walk on through if you want. So here it is, the Newcomb Tavern. Let's get my shadow person out of the way. Called George Nori. Here we go. Wow. This was the public building. Wow, the first one in Dayton. And this was the uh, this was the residence. This was the living quarters for the Newcomb family. Look at how the uh, the woods all a little bit offline, and there's more of that clay that my grandpa was pointing out when we were out there at the. Uh, the old Iddings estate the other day. Papal took us out there. And here is a bunch of mementos from the Newcomb family. Look at this old china. Check out the hot water bottle. There is Colonel George Newcomb, and this was actually, they said before it was the public building. It was built in 1796, and it was the home for this family, but they said they would let other people stay here as a boarding house as long as you brought your own bedding. The original keys to the tavern. And they said the original tavern was actually just this half that we're in right now, the living quarters, and the upstairs that you can't go to and they added on to it later. And there's a lot of the history to it. And there's the upstairs that we can't go see. Well, tavern side, that was the house side. Yeah. Tavern where everybody was welcome. And this was a main stopping point between Toledo and Cincinnati, so you definitely got oh. all sorts of people and, and people on a regular basis. So. Late uh, summer, early fall. Look at the banister. <laughs> so they were actually saying that this was just, this staircase was added when it became a museum because it would have taken up too much space. So my question was, how do they get upstairs then? And they pointed to this ladder. Wow, this is great. You got live caroling, a full-blown museum on the whole place, and then straight ahead is actually where we're going next, the Wright Brothers Aviation Center. And I was, I was teased by being told that they have a Wright Flyer in there, and I'm dying to see it. And when the Newcombs moved out of that tavern, they moved to this little colonial-style house. I think we should probably take a walk through it real quick, don't you? Let's see it. 
Oh, look at that. There's a couch. Like they're playing some cards. It is very cold in here. That would have been the kitchen area. There's another one. When I was in Granville visiting Seth, I didn't know what the heck that was. Now I know what it is. It's a carriage step. And there's the carriage post. All right, we're gonna go in here. And the first thing I noticed is that the building actually is the replica that I mentioned in my vlog the other day. If you remember, I told you that uh, Henry Ford was so fascinated by the Wright brothers that he actually bought the, the original structure and had it moved. They made a second one, a, uh, a replica, and I believe this is it. And honestly, it kind of looks like the one we went and visited the other day, you know? So I was correct, this actually is the, the replica building, and they were pointing out that this bike right there is actually one of the last five remaining bikes that the Wrights actually built themselves. One of the safety bikes, remember? Look at that, yeah. They were mainly a yeah, bike repair business, but they did build a few. And there's some of the old tires. This was our sales department in the you know, office and parts. Wow, that's so cool. And look at this. They have a, a little piece about Paul Lawrence Dunbar and the Dayton Tyler, like I mentioned the other day in the vlog, that, that they actually printed that on the second floor of this building. Well, this is the replica, but the original building. And look at this replica of their their workshop. And she actually said to to build the first airplane. They really did it. Off, they didn't have to borrow money. They did it off the profits of the bike shop, which is pretty cool. Look at that. It is, but it's actually up where you checked in. I don't know why they don't have it in this building. But if you check where you and I'm out, guessing this was the mm -hmm. kind of the precursor or his wind tunnel. Yeah. Yeah, it's a replica of one of the wind tunnels that they built. They have, all their early calculations were based on early aviators, and they of course discovered that they weren't working. And so then they started figuring out other ways of testing by using things like wind tunnels. And they tested over 200 of those airfoils that you can see up here to get the right size and shape of the wing number 12 even though they tested over 200 of them Back out the we're going on in yeah. now there is yeah, Orville and Wilbur and check oh, this oh, out yeah, this is actually has all the pictures from Kitty Hawk from all of that's the kite all the different test yeah, flights and they were actually yeah. telling us that that they um they in order to um, to to prove that they had done the flight, they actually would take photos and they actually had someone take the photo of them. And as she said, they did a coin toss to see who was actually gonna do the original flight that would get off the ground. And it was Wilbur who won the coin toss, but when he went to take off, something went wrong. So they always alternated. So then Orville got to take it. So that's actually Orville doing the flight and Wilbur off to the side. And then they have the actual camera right there. And she said that they, they actually didn't develop the film to see what they got until two years later, but they developed it themselves here in Dayton. Or two months, yeah, two months later um, when they got back to Dayton. There's their tripod. So this is the original propeller that they carved themselves. And uh, she said they actually got it right the first time, so that's it. Those are some of the family canes. You can see them actually. There's Milton right there. And, uh, and then there's Catherine and Orville right there. Now here is the 1905 plane. She was actually telling us that the 1903 is in the Smithsonian. The 1904 doesn't exist anymore, but she said this is the 1905 version and it actually has more original parts than any of the other um, previous two. Obviously the, the 1904 doesn't exist, but this is the actual plane. Look at that. 
and it's kind of like a glider. You see the way they were laying on that? And here they have a statue to Wilbur. And then over here, of course, one to Orville. And then we're gonna go take a look at the front of the plane now. And then here you can tell that the propellers were actually on the very back because they were concerned that if anything went wrong, that that uh, they would get thrown into the propellers. So they actually put those in the back as kind of a safety precaution. And the, uh, there's a tour guide that kind of follows you around and kind of tells you some stuff. And she was actually saying that that uh, they only actually had one crash. They were kind of sticklers for safety. And uh, she said this is the uh, this is the last time they would ever do a flight like this where there wasn't a seat and where you would lay on your stomach. Oh, so that was the fuel tank. And of course, flying it was a trick because um, they've got so many parts moving, like their left and right arms are doing two totally different motions. Um, the left is controlling the front elevator to make the plane go up and down, so that arm's going up and down. The right is controlling the back rudder from left and right, so that one's going left and right. But while you're flying, your arms are going in different ways. Um, his hips are in a cradle, so when it's time to turn, you can move his hips to trigger the wing warping to turn. And then when it was time to land, they had to come in like a glider, so the engine had to be off. Well, since his hands are occupied, you can see the rope above his head. He would lift his head up and catch that, and that would cut the engine off. And then they would just come straight in on the ground. That's why the bottom has kind of a ski sled type look to it, because they literally come straight down into the ground. They're not going to have landed gear until down the road. But it took them only six years from the kite to this airplane, even though man had been trying to figure it out for hundreds and hundreds of years, and only six years for that. never saw the airplane turn into 11. And of course, like I mentioned, they ended up using airplanes for, for the war, for, for the military purpose, and uh, she was saying that because Wilbur died of tuberculosis, that uh, he never actually saw it used as a, uh, as a weapon. I can't believe we're actually looking at the 1905 Wright Flyer. <laughs> wow. Now it'd be pretty, pretty complicated to explain the entire operation of this, but I think you guys, I think you guys got a pretty good view from here. So one of the things that's pretty interesting we just found out was that uh, you see it looks like a lot of metal, that that's all metal or whatever. It's actually not. It's wood that they painted to look like metal. And they said the engine looks like it's cast iron, but it's actually made out of aluminum because they were afraid people would try and rip off their designs. And they thought if somebody saw this and saw that it looked like it was all made out of metal, that they would try and replicate that and it would never fly. So that's actually all wood. All that bracing look. Pretty cool, pretty ingenious. We are just about done in here, but they have Wilbur's Bell. Look at that. It even says 1908. And here they're being honored in Dayton. Now here you'll see the canoe, and the canoe is actually originally attached to underneath the plane because they were they were testing out their flights near the uh, the Statue of Liberty, and they realized it was highly possible that they could crash, and uh, and so they attached this to the bottom of the plane, creating the idea for the very first seaplane. And they even have a puppet show inside here about the Wright Brothers' history. Look at this old Sunoco gas station, the old Sun Oil Company. 
Now we're gonna walk a little bit further down here. And because I wanna show you guys something, it's not really, I don't know if it's that exciting or whatever, but it's exciting to me because when I was a kid, and you might relate to this, sometimes you have memories of going places with your family and one of those times for me was every time we would go to Dayton, anytime somebody say, okay, we're going to Dayton, I would always look forward to it because I'd always like to see the old Reynolds and Reynolds clock tower. And they actually, I noticed when I was driving down through here this last trip, I go, geez, I wonder what happened to that. And then we just noticed it's actually over here. So we're gonna stop by and see it. And there it is. I used to always see this on top of a building as we would drive through. 1866. Now that bridge right there, they said is actually closed off right now, but on the other side of that bridge was actually where the Erie Canal was. And then inside here is actually the Dayton Cycle Company. So now you actually get to see in real person life, or at least through my real person life, the big wheel. This is what they called the big wheel. And when the Wright brothers started selling bicycles, that's when Kind of that style went out the uh, the large wheel in front and the small wheel in back and they went to this more modern design that we know now which was called the uh, the safety bike or the the safety bicycle they uh, they thought it was safer to have the two wheels matching well gang I hope you guys enjoyed this I had no agenda when I started today other than I just wanted to hang out with my sister and we started roaming around and next thing I knew we were in Carillon Park and I had no idea how much great stuff that this place had. You guys didn't even see a fraction of it because I didn't know it was going to be here and we would have been in there for another two hours. So I wanted to really kind of focus in on specific things that I came to see which were kind of like mainly the national cash register stuff. Now one thing I didn't get to talk about too much was that uh, they have a section of one of the buildings out here that's dedicated to the 1913 flood. And why that was kind of significant was because it flooded out quite a bit of Dayton. And that's actually how, when I took you over to where the Wright brothers lived at Hawthorne Hill, up on that hill, that section over there was actually um, the man who bought the rights to the cash register and actually um, mass produced them and started the National Cash Register Company. Mr. Patterson, uh, when that flood happened, he actually had a bunch of his employees uh, build 300 boats so that they could go around and save people that were um, in need around the city. And they built a lot of those houses right over there because they were on top of the hill. So, hope you guys have a great night, happy new year, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Actually, this is... This is what I was telling you about. I'll put this on as our very last thing. This is footage of the 1913 flood. And there's some of the aftermath. Good night.